Cut on scale, Makara, and welcome back to the channel with the biggest Lee Rody on the internet. I am your host, the Duke himself, and today we're going to take a look at what would happen if you took a knife from the Middle Ages and stuck him right into the middle of World War II. I kid you not, this is mental. But you asked for it, and the Duke always delivers for his people. So without any further delay, let's take a look at one of the most eccentric and extraordinary human beings that we will ever discuss on this series. John, Malcolm, Torp, Fleming, Churchill, better known as Mad Jack Churchill. I didn't think to put my daughter in. Uh... I don't care what other people think. Really was coming from my face, here and there. Never in the field of human conscious was so much owed by so many. So Where did we get such men? At the going down of the sun, we will remember them. The legend of Malcolm Torp Fleming Churchill, otherwise known as Mad Jack Churchill, starts off as a bit of a mystery in itself. Depending on whom you listen to, he was either born in Colombo, Sri Lanka, British controlled Hong Kong, or Surrey in England. The truth is, his family is located in Surrey, England at the time of his birth, so it's gonna go down to Surrey for me. The nature of his father's employment as a civil engineer in the colonial service was the cause of this confusion, as the family frequently moved between locations. Born to Alec Fleming Churchill and his wife Eleanor Elizabeth, whose family hailed from County Cavan in Ireland by the way, Mad Jack was raised on a diet of Anglo-Scottish lore with his brothers Thomas Bell Lindsay Churchill and Robert Alec Farquhar Churchill. His folks obviously had a great sense of humour. Jack's father hailed from Anglo-Scottish roots in the Scottish Highlands and thus instilled this hard-born attitude into all three of his sons. There were no weeping pansies in this crop, let me tell you. Both of his brothers would go on to be exceptional warriors as well, so there was definitely something in the blood. Jack became obsessed with medieval lore due to his upbringing. He developed a great taste in castles, swords, longbows, a fascination that would go on to mould the legend himself. Obviously. From a very young age, Jack craved adventure and often dreamed about exploring the world and living life on the edge. This burning desire led him to all manners of unusual and noteworthy experiences. But first, Jack would go on to be educated at the suitably named Dragon School in Oxford, then to King William's College and the Isle of Man. Once done with that, he attended the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. In 1926, he was commissioned into the 2nd Battalion Manchester Regiment and was then dispatched to Rangoon, Burma for further training. He then headed out to undertake a signals course in Pune, Western India. After the completion of the course in Pune, he decided to ride a Zenith motorcycle 1,500 miles across the Indian subcontinent. While riding with the wind in his hair, he crashed into a water buffalo. Thankfully, he survived, but I'm not sure about the buffalo. But the adventures of Mad Jack were only just beginning. While he was in Burma, he used to cross bridges with open sleepers, walking across while pushing his motorcycle along the rails, carrying nothing of the large crocodile sweeping the river below. Sleepers are those plank type things that look like railway tracks by the way. Some people are just charmed I guess. While at his regiment he was taught how to play the bagpipes by the pipe major of the Cameron Highlanders. He became quite good and adopted the skill into his military career, often leading his men into combat with a crusty old tune, or maybe the bagpipes were a form of audio torture to torment the enemy. Who knows, but it most definitely worked to fire up his battle brothers. He would also receive the first of his service medals, the Indian General Service Medal with Burma Clasp. Once back in England, Jack quickly became bored with the dull life in the post-World War I military, as nothing was going on. He left his service so he could travel and pursue a career in acting and entertainment, even securing a role in the 1924 movie The Thief of Baghdad. In this movie, he would exhibit his skill with a longbow and bagpipes. It was only a small part, but still an interesting experience to have on the old resume. He also became a male model for a time, and worked as an editor in Nairobi, Kenya. Yeah, you heard me, a male model. Afterwards, it was on to Norway, where he would represent Great Britain in the World Archery Championships in 1939. But these events were nothing to write home about, because without knowing it, Jack was waiting for something else to happen. Something that Mad Jack was born and raised for. World War II. Since he never really left the service and had just gone into inactive reserve, 
Once the war broke out, Churchill was straight back at it, and the legend of Mad Jack would commence in a suitable setting. At the initial stages of World War II, the British forces were quickly outflanked and overwhelmed by German forces after the French surrendered and left them hanging, so they had to make a hasty retreat to Dunkirk, where they awaited extraction and relocation to Britain in order to regroup. Hitler was always reluctant to destroy the British Empire, at least according to his own assertions, so he held off the full weight of his forces for four days in order to give the British troops enough time to retreat. He was also appealing for reason from Winston Churchill, claiming that he was not interested in an invasion of Britain, but if Churchill didn't withdraw, he would have no choice but to launch a full-scale attack. I remember him using a similar tactic with Stalin. Most likely Hitler wanted time to solidify his tentative position in France before taking on any other battles. Anyway, whatever Hitler's motivations really were, Winston Churchill gave him the middle finger and the fate of the troops currently stranded had to rely on the bravery of ordinary British citizens to save them. But there was another Churchill working to save the stranded men from the full brunt of the Nazi forces. Mad Jack Churchill and his bunch of merry men. Mad Jack and his regiment were deployed to France as part of the expeditionary force. During this period Jack often used a bow and arrow while on patrol. That's right, you heard me again. A fecking bow and arrow. Jack was born for the commandos. Or maybe the commandos were born for him. At this point I'm thinking the entirety of World War II itself was started just for this fella to do his thing. During training missions Churchill would often lead his men into a charge while brandishing a basket hilted clay bag sword which is a one handed sword that is more practical than the often quoted broadsword well as practical as carrying a sword into a gunfight can be I suppose. Jack once commented a man who goes into combat without a sword is improperly dressed. After the Battle of Lepinet, Mad Jack's company was surrounded by the enemy and became trapped. Rather than lose confidence, Jack used the opportunity to not shoot a reported kill with a longbow. The effective range of a longbow is about 200 yards, so interestingly enough, it fits into the common range of the average firefight. When the heat ramped up, Jack held off the Germans by using two machine guns until he ran out of ammo. After laying waste to the enemy and holding his position for the day, Jack then led his company out to safety by taking them right through German lines under the cover of darkness. Somehow, he managed to do this with a gunshot wound to his shoulder. Serious badassery there, brother, but as outstanding as this particular tale may be, I can't help but to wonder about the Nazi officer's reaction when he looked down to see that he'd just been tagged by a fucking arrow. Now, in full honesty, the story about the longbow kill in this particular battle wasn't confirmed. Jack himself claimed that his longbow had been crushed by a lorry earlier in the campaign. But the rest is spot on. In 1941 Jack ended up in Norway again, this time second in command of number 3 commando unit during Operation Archery, ironically not named after the man himself. The unit raided Nazi garrison stores and fish oil factories at Vogsey. He was again reported to embolden his men by playing the bagpipes. In fact, he entered combat while playing March of the Cameron Men on the old crooning octopus before chucking the first grenade of the exchange and then charging into the fray with a clay bag sword still affixed to his hip. Remarkably, footage does exist of the raid in progress and of Jack playing the bagpipes afterwards while the rest of the unit dances to a merry tune. Churchill was awarded the military cross and bar for his bravery during this raid and at the Battle of Lepinette. After Norway, Churchill was sent to Sicily and commanded number no. 2 commando during their landing at Catania, part of the Allied invasion of Sicily. Leaping from the landing craft with sword on hip, longbow and quiver slung around his neck and bagpipes wailing under his arm, Jack Churchill led his men into combat in atypical style. He repeated this process at the landings in Salerno. One can only wonder what the Germans thought when they beheld the image of a marauding Anglo-Scot charging up the beachhead in full Highlander blood mode. I also wonder if he ran into Audie Murphy while fighting on the same soil. How the world didn't crack open with the presence of both badasses in the same campaign is beyond me. During the Salerno landings, Jack Churchill was in command of number two commando. He was ordered to capture a German observation post just outside of the town of Molina, which was controlling access to a path that led straight down to the Salerno beachhead. With the aid of a brave corporal, he infiltrated the town kicked some ass and captured 42 German soldiers, including a mortar squad. No doubt he saved many Allied troops by doing so. With all of these prisoners now in his hands, 
The sword-wielding Anglo-Scot warrior Eccentric was tasked with leading them back down to the beachhead. He managed this by having German soldiers wheel their own injured along in carts as he and the corporal herded them on. Churchill would later comment that the scene was reminiscent of the Napoleonic Wars. For this display of master soldiering, he received the Distinguished Service Cross. After delivering the prisoners, he walked back to town to retrieve his sword, which he claimed he'd lost in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Germans. In other words, he was bloody well using it. During the Maclean mission in 1944, Jack Churchill led the commandos into action in Yugoslavia, a support for Joseph Bros Tito's partisans. Although Tito was a communist and the president of the Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia, he and his partisans were the most effective resistance to the Axis forces during World War II. Churchill was ordered to raid the German control island of Brack. For this purpose, Jack organized a party of heavy hitters composed of 1,500 partisans, 43 commando, and one troop from 40 commando. The landing went off without a hitch but upon encountering the gun emplacements and taking heavy German fire, the partisans elected to defer the raid until the following day. But Churchill went ahead with it, leading his commandos into the charge with a blast of his bagpipes. Unfortunately, he and his commandos were straight by a friendly spitfire, so Churchill decided to call off the raid until the following morning. When morning finally came, a flanking manoeuvre was launched by 43 commando, with Churchill leading 40 commando. Once again, the partisans remained at the landing area. Typical commies. The attack didn't go well for the Allies as a result. Only Churchill and six others managed to reach the objective. Sadly, a mortar shell detonated next to the men as they closed in and killed or badly wounded all of the party, except for Churchill, who was playing Will You Know Come Back Again on the bagpipes as the Germans advanced on his position. He continued to blow on his pipes until he was eventually knocked out by an exploding grenade. Big man energy on this bloke, I love it. The unconscious Jack Churchill was taken captive by the Germans, and believing that he may be related to the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, German intelligence flew him out to Berlin for interrogation. Afterwards, Jack transferred to a special compound for prominent POWs, which included actual or suspected relatives of Winston Churchill. The POW compound was situated in Sachsenhausen concentration camp, which held Joseph Stalin's eldest son, Yakov Zhugashvili, among other high-profile prisoners. The camp was equipped with a gas chamber and a medical experimentation area. The prisoners were treated inhumanely, commonly tortured and killed openly. It was no fun house, despite Jack's jocular reputation. In September of 1944, Churchill, along with Major Johnny Dodge and three Royal Air Force officers who had previously survived the Great Escape, went for gold and managed to tunnel out of Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Churchill and Bertram James, one of the RAF officers who had survived the Great Escape, attempted to walk out along the Baltic coast. Unfortunately, they were recaptured near the German town of Rostock, a couple of kilometres away from liberation. In late April of 1945, Churchill and about 140 other high-profile prisoners were transferred from Dachau to South Tyrol under escort of the SS and the SD, the latter being the German intelligence division of the SS. The movement was personally ordered by Adolf Hitler and actioned by Gestapo chief Heinrich Müller. Since it was clearly the closing weeks of the war, the prisoners suspected that they were to be executed in a similar manner as the men of the Great Escape. The SS and the SD men were becoming more aggressive as the days passed, and heavy drinking was common. During the morning of the 28th of April, one of the prisoners came across a drunken SD man passed out on the ground. The prisoner went through his pockets and found a document that contained orders to eliminate 28 British officers and other military prisoners. On Sunday the 29th of April, Colonel Bogoslaw von Braunen, a German officer who had been imprisoned for disobeying Hitler's orders, approached the local Weimark liaison office in Niederdorf and asked to contact his old friend Colonel General Heinrich von Weitinghoff, the commander of the Army Group C. Von Weitinghoff was unavailable, but von Braunen was able to reach another friend, General Hans Rottiger, Weitinghoff's chief of staff. He explained the situation and warned his friend about the planned executions. Von Voitinghoff called von Braunen back two hours later and assured him that he would dispatch a Wehrmacht officer and a company of infantry to provide safe passage for the prisoners. Simultaneously, many of the prisoners had organised a plan to assassinate the most aggressive of the SS and SD men. Wehrmacht Captain Richard von Alvensleben made a reconnaissance trip to Niederdorf later that evening. He quickly assessed the looming danger and reported back. Once the true intent of the SS had been ascertained, 
Von Alvin's Leben intervened and explained that he was an emissary of the commander in chief of Army Group C. He was told to F off by the SS, and having only two men with him at the time, Von Alvin's Leben disengaged and radioed back for a battle group to be dispatched immediately. 45 minutes later, 15 armed NCOs of the Weimar showed up and surrounded the town that the SS were residing in. Von Alvin's Leben recognised that tensions were rising and that a stronger message needed to be sent. He radioed a larger force that was located about 4 kilometres away. Two hours later, 150 men from an infantry training battalion showed up to reinforce the Weimar. The SS eventually backed down and all the prisoners were delivered safely to their original destination. The Weimar guarded and protected the prisoners from marauding Nazi parties that were seeking victims and were even willing to engage American forces when they showed up, believing them to be German soldiers looking to kill the prisoners. Once the Americans made themselves known, the Weimar laid down their weapons and surrendered. Fair play, men. After being released, Churchill walked 150 kilometers to Verona, Italy, where he met up with an American armored unit. With the war in the Pacific still raging, Churchill was sent to Burma, where major land battles with the Japanese were still ongoing. By the time he'd reached India, the bomb had already been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, effectively bringing the war to an abrupt end. Whereas the rest of the world was in celebration, Churchill was extremely disappointed with this outcome, claiming, if it weren't for those damn Yanks, we could have kept the war going for another 10 years. After the war, Jack Churchill qualified as a parachutist and transferred to the Seaford Highlanders. He was eventually posted to Mandatory Palestine as Executive Officer of the 1st Battalion of the Highland Light Infantry. Just before the end of the British Mandate in 1948, Churchill got himself involved in another conflict. Along with 12 of his soldiers, he attempted to assist a Hadassah medical convoy that came under attack by Arab forces. This act was in direct contradiction to standing British military orders. Churchill was one of the first men on the scene and knocked on the bus to offer assistance. He suggested that he be allowed to evacuate members of the convoy in his APC, despite being ordered, again, not to take part in the fighting. The Hadassah medical convoy turned Churchill down, believing that a rescue by the Jewish Haganah was imminent. They were wrong, and no such rescue ever showed up. With the Arab forces closing in on the convoy, Churchill and his men provided cover fire. Two of the convoy trucks caught fire in the fighting and 77 of the 79 people contained in them were killed. The incident would become known as the Hadassah Medical Convoy Massacre. Some nasty business there. Imagine if Mad Jack hadn't been in command in that place at that time. The carnage would have been total. None of the convoy would have survived. After the massacre, Jack Churchill coordinated the evacuation of 700 Jewish doctors students and patients from the Hadassah Hospital on the Hebrew University campus on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem, which had been the final destination of the convoy. In later years, Churchill went on to serve as an instructor at the Land Air Warfare School in Australia. While there, he discovered a love of surfing, and upon his return to Britain, he became the first man to ride the River Severn's five-foot tidal bore. He even designed his own board. Mad Jack Churchill retired from the army in 1959, but it would not be an end to his unique ways. While commuting on a train home, he would frequently shock fellow passengers and security guards by launching his briefcase out the window into the backyard of a house that sat alongside the railway tracks. He would later confess that he was actually chucking it into his own back garden so he wouldn't have to carry it home from the station. He also enjoyed sailing coal-fired ships around this time and playing with remote-controlled model warships. The eccentric and story-filled life of Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill would come to an end on March 8, 1996, where it all began in the county of Surrey, England. He was 89 years of age. It's not often that the world encounters such a man as Mad Jack Churchill, and despite his almost comedic antics, the confidence that he instilled in his men and the resolve with which he faced the hardships and horror of war defined his leadership and military career. Men like Jack Churchill could turn the outcome of a battle into your favour in the blink of an eye. He seemed to truly relish combat and the crucible of war, without any trace of anger or hate in him at all. Even post-war he showed no hint of PTSD or any kind of maladjustment. A very interesting character and a true badass. May you rest in peace, Mad Jack. You leave behind an inspiring legacy and the trace of a life lived to the maximum. Enjoy those heavenly waves, brother. Totally rad. So 
there we have it. Told you to be mental. What a guy. Anyway, if you've made it this far, and you've watched it all the way up to this point right now, the Duke abides. I appreciate it very much. Thank you all for supporting the channel. It really means a lot to me. Thanks for watching the videos. Special thanks to all of you who are engaging. All of you who voted for Mad Jack Churchill on the poll that we just did. I'll probably do more of those. They were fun. Anyway, my deepest, my deepest loves for all of you. And I hope to see you again in the next one real soon. Get out of here and look after yourselves. Remember, as always, stand up, speak up. Don't back up. Slaunching Makara.